This is Hubert N. Allier, Professor of Chemistry, Princeton University. His subject today, Atomic Energy, Weapon for Peace. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Princeton University, presents Princeton 55, an exploration into education through television. A series of programs intended to bring into your living room the exciting ideas and important men of one of the nation's leading universities. Princeton 55 is intended for the listener with an inquisitive mind. Now meet Professor Hubert N. Allier. His subject, Atomic Energy, Weapon for peace. Today I'm going to tell you about the story of the atom bomb, and I'm going to teach you a lot of chemistry, because I don't believe you can understand the good and the bad that will come out of this story unless you know that chemistry. Well, I don't mean the kind of chemistry that they have in Hollywood with some kind of a weird monster bending over his pots and retorts and all kinds of smokes and fires and fumes. No, it's something much more ordinary than that. Let's burn a piece of paper. When the paper begins to catch fire, this is a chemical reaction. Oh, it's an amazing thing. Here is this white paper turning into black carbon, and all from it come carbon dioxide and water, because the paper is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now I'm going to do another chemical reaction, this time with a lump of sugar. I'm going to burn it. It, too, has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in. I'm going to burn it by eating it. I love to do this experiment. And when the sugar gets down inside of me, it's going to burn up like the paper. Well, I'm not going to give off smoke and fumes, but tomorrow I'm going to get some energy off when the paper uh, and sugar burn up inside of me and give me carbon dioxide, which I breathe out, and water, which I perspire. And instead of giving me this energy, it's going to give me muscular energy. Now today, I want to talk about explosives. I'm going to talk about chemical explosives and atom bomb explosives. In the case of the chemical explosives, here's one which is quite familiar to you. TNT, the TNT chemical explosive is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. As a matter of fact, it's a ring of carbons. It's toluene and three nitrogen oxygen groups called nitro groups. And three nitros give us tri-nitro-toluene. Now, this particular molecule very suddenly breaks down. And when it breaks down, it breaks down into oxides of carbon, nitrogen, and oxides, and water. And the thing I want you to notice is that the products that are formed uh, contain the same chemical elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, as the original TNT that you started with. The atom bomb explosion is entirely different. When the atom bomb explodes, uh, we have instead chemical elements changing into other elements. Why, you say, this is fantastic. This is alchemy. This is what the alchemist tried to do when he took lead and tried to make the lead into gold, yes? And when the atom bomb goes off, uh, we have elements changing into others, as, for example, in the case of the A-bomb, when a big atom splits into two and gives us two particles, or in the case of the H-bomb, when two little atoms will come together and fuse to form helium. Or finally, in the bomb that I call the L-bomb, in which lithium and hydrogen, probably double heavy hydrogen, combine to form the element helium. Now, these are chemical uh, reactions in which elements have changed, and these are called the atom bomb type of reaction. I want to talk about the uh, three types of characteristics associated with these bombs, and the first one is that these explosions give off energy. You're all familiar with that. You're familiar that when, in the case of a chemical reaction, energy comes off, you burn this match, and you can see the match turning into heat and flame, and actually, if you burn about that volume of carbon, you will get off from this reaction about four electron volts of energy. Uh, for the ladies, that's 100,000 calories. Here's an interesting little chemical factory, a, a flashlight battery. And uh, when you press the button of the flashlight, uh, you actually get like, a little chemical reaction happening in there and about a volt and a half generated. In other words, I want you to get the idea that, that when we have three volts above, we have two of these batteries in here. In other words, when a chemical reaction occurs, you get a few electron volts of energy. Now I'm going to show you a reaction that gives off almost as much energy as TNT. Have it over here. It's a mixture in which uh, a chemical reaction will occur, and uh, it will get so hot it will form molten iron inside of this crucible, and will drop down out of the hole in the bottom of this crucible here. Into I'll put this tin pan down in here, so it'll drop down into the water in the tin pan here, 
and going to give us almost as much energy as TNT. It gives it, but doesn't give it quite fast enough to be explosive. <laughs> at least it never has until this afternoon. Now, we're going to take and we're going to start this, remember, almost as much energy as TNT. So we start, I'm going to protect this from the, from the uh, camera so the camera doesn't burn. And now we're going to see an enormous quantity of energy. I want to protect it. <laughs> happened, the molten iron bubbling down in here, you can hear blub, 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 blub. As a matter of fact, I can reach in here, you can actually see the molten material coming in here, and uh, we can see that it has fallen right through the bottom of the pan. You can see here the molten iron is actually generated in there. This is a chemical reaction giving off a great deal of energy. How about an atom bomb? Does it give off enough energy? Well, you know, Einstein told us the answer about that way back in 1905. It's amazing what that fellow did in 1905. He published five papers in five entirely different fields, any one of which would have won him a Nobel Prize. He also got married that year. <laughs> he didn't really, but it makes a better story. And he told us what would happen in the case of some of these atom bomb-type reactions. Uh, that uh, Instead of just a few volts of energy coming off, we have, for example, for the lithium-hydrogen reaction, a billion electron volts coming off. Um, enormous qualities of energy coming off. What significance does that have for us? Well, it means uh, that when a lump of uranium about this big, it's very heavy, it weighs about a uh, half a ton, that much uranium undergoing its reaction could give off enough energy, more energy than all the TNT dropped by all the airplanes during all of World War II. Or to put it another way, suppose you had uh, raids on all the cities of the world tonight carrying some of these atom bombs. 2,000 planes, one night's raid. How many nights would you have to fly TNT? And the answer is, instead of a single night, you'd have to carry TNT, 2,000 planes, night after night for 130,000 years. Uh, does it give off enough energy? <laughs> I'm sure you all know the answer now. Now, the second characteristic of an explosion is that it must give the energy off continuously and fast. If it doesn't do it, it's not an explosion. Different reactions take place at different rates. For example, here is a chemical reaction that takes quite a while to complete itself. I'm mixing the solutions together. Energy is coming off. If it had come off suddenly, uh, the uh, uh, talk would have been over a, a few seconds ago. Uh, but no, slowly it's coming off, and finally it will signal to us when the reaction is at an end. This is a slow, there we are, a reaction at an end, a slow chemical reaction. Let's do another slow reaction, uh, the burning of a candle. Uh, one uh, uh, realizes, of course, that the air has to come down combined with this candle. It doesn't happen fast. You have to wait for the air to combine. How can you burn it up fast? You can burn it up fast, you get an explosion. Well, let's burn your candle at both ends. We burn our candle at both ends. The air gets to it twice as fast. The candle will burn up in half the time. If you burn the candle at both ends, you'll only live half as long. But it's more than twice the fun. <laughs> now, suppose we take this and break it up into a million little candles. Um, oh, every little bit of candle lighted all at once, that's an explosion. It's going off constantly and fast. Well, let's do this. Uh, uh, actually, I'm not going to break up the candle and take a little flower, just ordinary flower dust. Each one of those little particles like a little candle. I'm going to put them down inside of a, a funnel inside of the milk can here, such as when I squeeze the bulb, the flower will come up out of here. But that won't catch on fire. We have to have a flame. You know, when you go into a flour mill, this is the principle of a dust explosion. When you go into a flour mill, you're careful not to make a spark, because if you do, you'll come out to the roof instead of the door. So um, I'm going to take and I'm going to light a candle down in here. This supplies the energy. And the candle's now burning. And then when I squeeze this bulb, we're going to see all these little particles burning quickly. And away we go. It's just ordinary flour. This is fantastic. A chemical explosion. How about the atom bomb explosion? Does it give off this energy continuously? To answer this, the government, during the war years, built the so-called atomic pile. You have a model of here at the University of Chicago. It was a big pile of graphite or carbon, uh, something like uh, uh, about as big as your house. And embedded in this graphite were lumps of uranium, uh, sort of like the, the raisin in this uh, raisin bread here. And in such a condition, the reaction that's in the bomb continues, it gives off energy, didn't give it off fast enough, because if it had, the University of Chicago's uh, pile had exploded. Uh, the city of Chicago would have complained, that is what was left of it. But just three weeks before the bomb dropped on Japan, now from the experiments with the pile, they were ready to try this out in New Mexico, and a lump of uranium, uh, no bigger than a hand grenade, knocked down two men outside of the control center a mile away from where the bomb went off. 
Did it give off enough energy? <laughs> Those two men lying on the ground knew the answer. It had given off enough energy. I found myself asking, how is it possible a lump of uranium no bigger than a man's head to destroy a city? And I said, does it give off energy? You bet your life of billions of electron volts. Does it keep on giving it off continuously? Japan was suing for peace. That was the answer. The third aspect of explosions is its uh, effects of the products that come off. In the case of the chemical explosion, uh, enormous products come off and give a blast effect. Uh, the gases that come off can't get away quick enough. For example, uh, when we exploded this, nothing much happened to the can because we had a big top on it and the, and the gases just came out. But uh, let's do this over again. Put the top on here and not let the gases get away. In other words, we're going to repeat the experiment, but we're going to see the blast effect. Now, we put the uh, flower in there. We're going to light the candle. We're all ready to do it. But the uh, only difference is we're going to confine it. <laughs> This isn't any challenge at all in this studio. <laughs> the chem lab in Princeton has a, a ceiling 50 feet high. I've got more holes in the ceiling up there. But at any rate, let's take this. We'll put it on here. Remember, it's going to have all the effects of a chemical blast. One, two, three, and away we go. <laughs> I'm going to get out of the way. It's <laughs> safe and sane. And so you can see uh, what happens when a chemical explosion goes off. <laughs> now with an A-bomb explosion, uh, we have three interesting effects. Uh, first, we have the blast effect, which is not very much different uh, from the chemical effect, except that it's uh, a million times more powerful. And also, in principle, uh, the characteristics of it is somewhat different. Uh, I'm going to draw now the blast effect and plotting pressure, the pressure that's been made against the time of the explosion. And what we find is that with an ordinary TNT explosion, there's a sudden increase in pressure, then a sudden decrease, about two-thirds as much. In other words, there's a pressure followed by a suction. And then the explosion is over. This all takes about a thousandth of a second. But with an atom bomb explosion, this curve is quite different. With an atom bomb explosion, you have a huge fireball with enormous heat in it, about 50 million degrees hotter than the sun. And it takes several seconds for this energy to get away from the fireball. The result is that the, the plot for the atom bomb type of explosion is a sudden explosion of pressure, and it lasts for a long while, so that you have a whole area of uh, explosion that may last for a second or so. And with such an uh, explosion for an atom bomb, uh, we find that this pressure presses on all sides of the building, and the top of the building just completely collapses. That's why you have these uh, complete shambles in the Japanese cities that were bombed by these, or uh, remember that civil defense uh, a wooden house that just suddenly disintegrated because of this long, continued explosion. Now, in addition to the blast effect, there are two other effects that it would be interesting to, to mention. And, and this next one, and incidentally, the blast effect, uh, take that away, <laughs> Bruce Trian has his uh, angels, but I have little Maxwell Young demons who do this for me. In the case of the, um, uh, also, we have a burn effect. Uh, this burn is due to infrared light, uh, something like the infrared light in, in our household, uh, except a million times uh, greater. So great, in fact, that uh, one-third of all the Japanese people who were killed by the bomb were burned to death by this infrared light. Uh, as a matter of fact, out of that fireball comes the infrared light for about uh, um, uh, 10 seconds and will burn everything within an area of 40 miles an enormous uh, uh, bit of light, uh, but, uh, and this is one of the reasons why the civil defense uh, people uh, have been uh, so busy in the last few weeks talking about how to protect people in the case of the blast. Since it's only 10 miles, it's obvious you've got to evacuate cities, and they're planning how can we get the people away from the blast effect, because the only way you can uh, be safe from the blast effect, I guess, is to live right. And in the case of the burn effect, however, Ah, this is light, and there's a saving grace there, because this infrared light travels in a straight line, and if it casts a shadow when an object gets in the light, it'll cast a shadow, and if you get into the shadow, you'll be saved. And so you can uh, save yourself from this infrared light by getting behind a brick wall or ducking down into a shelter or getting behind somebody who's bigger than you are and staying in the shadow, and you'll be saved. As a matter of fact, um, in the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosion, when there were open windows and the infrared light came in through the open window, it cast and burned uh, a, a path on the grass matting. And if there were objects in the window, they cast a shadow, and where the shadow was, the matting didn't burn. And by measuring the length of that shadow from one house and then going to another part of the city and measuring the length of the shadow in another house, they could, by triangulation, the scientists uh, could calculate where the point zero was that the bomb had gone off. 
The third effect of these bombs is their radioactive fallout. This is a, a fact that we have heard a great deal about from the Atomic Energy Commission during the last uh, few uh, years. As a matter of fact, we might have a little map over here now which shows you the Atomic Energy Commission has shown us the enormous uh, uh, distance that is uh, uh, damaged by this uh, fallout. Um, about 7,000 square miles are damaged all the way from Washington. The bomb going off in Washington would destroy Baltimore and uh, Chester and Wilmington and Philadelphia and Trenton and uh, I see they don't have a Princeton here so I have to put a little star here for Princeton and New Brunswick and New York and New York. This is fantastic that such a fallout could cover such an enormous uh, area and yet this is quite true. Why is it true? Well, let's do a little calculation. When the bomb goes off, um, enormous quantities of dust are blown into the air. Uh, as a matter of fact, this dust travels enormous numbers of miles. Uh, when, for example, in 1883, uh, the volcano Krakatoa blew its top. Dust was shot into the air and completely encircled the earth. And for two years afterwards, there were beautiful red sunsets because of the dust in the air. Well, in the same way, when a hydrogen bomb, for example, explodes near the dust, tremendous uh, amounts of dust are thrown into the air and will travel these great distances and come pattering down on people as much as uh, 400 miles away. The fantastic distances. Um, why is this so? Well, let's make this calculation. Um, fortunately, this radioactive material that comes off um, lasts uh, only a few days. It loses its radioactivity. Let's say that it loses its radioactivity a certain amount in one day. And we compare this with radium, which loses its uh, radioactivity in 1,600 years. In other words, uh, the stuff uh, from the radioactive bomb is very much more reactive than radium. How much more reactive? Well, it would be one day times 365 days in the year times uh, uh, 1,600 years. Or in other words, this uh, radioactive product could easily be 400 times more dangerous than radium. And since there are only four pounds of radium available in the world today, um, we can see that one pound of radioactive uh, material which clings to the dust and blows across the country could be 100,000 times more active than the four pounds of radium that we have in the world today. So uh, the problem of uh, the defense against this radioactive fallout, incidentally, also has a reassuring um, angle, namely uh, that this radioactivity only lasts a few days. And so if you can get out of the way of it, you'll be quite safe. You can go down into a shelter. This is one of the reasons that Val Peterson, for example, our administrator in Washington in civil defense, has uh, suggested to all our civilians that they provide themselves with a shelter and provide it with food so they can stay down in the shelter for a long period of time, perhaps uh, a week or so. And then when they emerge, uh, the radioactivity will have been gone. As a matter of fact, if the Japanese fishermen had only known this and stayed down in their cabins for a length of time, uh, they would have uh, been quite different in medical history. This, then, is the military story. And now we come to the peacetime story, Atoms for Peace. This story is summarized by showing you two instruments, two of the most fantastic instruments man has ever invented, the, the atomic pile, which uh, uh, generates power and new elements, and the Geiger counter, or more recent uh, uh, scintillometers and instruments similar to it. And these two instruments are going to give an entirely new world of science to us. The atomic pile, for example, is a source of power. Uh, you see, the pipes that are coming out of here will conduct the heat that would ordinarily be generated in the bomb. And uh, the liquids coming out of here would run into water, and the water would generate steam, the steam run the turbine, the turbine run the dynamo, and so you'd get uh, electricity from this. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've summarized here uh, some of the uh, discoveries that the Atomic Energy Commission has announced in the relation to getting cheap electricity from a power pile. In 1900, this was all done out of Idaho, incidentally. In 1951, they had built a materials tester reactor. Now, the tester reactor was merely an atomic pile in which they inserted various kinds of uh, metal pipes to see what kind of pipes should you use to get cheap electricity. Pipes of iron, aluminum, copper, uh, pipes and, uh, of, of uh, plastic and rubber in order to find the effect of the materials in the pile on these pipes. By 1900, and they're still testing a lot of them today, by 1952, they had the experimental breeder reaction. This particular reactor used a fuel which was not an atomic fuel originally, it was thorium. Very interesting to the uh, people in India who have lots of thorium. And this material would, would, if you put it into the pile, breed all kinds of 
of radioactive materials which could be used for generating power. In other words, we find that, that every time one uranium is used up in the pile, three thoriums change into three other kinds of uranium, and they breed a fissionable fuel, in other words. In 1953, it was announced that we had run out in Idaho a prototype of a submarine reactor actually uh, underwater, atomic power, running out there in Idaho just as if we're out in the Atlantic and uh, we announced that it ran successfully and actually uh, the cost of the material that was used in the submarine reactor giving us electricity was only about 10 times what the Idaho Power Company could deliver in the way of electricity to the site. They ran motors, they lighted lights, they did everything with this submarine reactor pile. Um, and today, the Nautilus uh, making tests out in the Atlantic is an example of this submarine reactor in use. Um, matter of fact, I just came back from Washington last weekend with a very interesting bit of uh, information that they have declassified. Do you know how long that submarine reactor can stay underwater before it comes to the surface? Three years. You don't have to come to the surface in time for the men to re-enlist. <laughs> Now, the, the last thing that the, the Atomic Energy Commission is now busy doing, have been busy for about a year, is to try to make cheap power using some of this information. Actually, they have devised and are now building five different types of reactors. Three of them are at very high temperatures. Uh, two of them are pilot plants. Entirely different in design, each one of them. They'll cost between 10 and $70 million. How long will it be before we know whether we're going to have cheap electricity from atomic power piles? Well, this is something we can't tell until they have built these. That's going to take a couple of years, two or three years, until they have analyzed the cost of them, until they have projected new uh, uh, power piles. And by that time, five years or so, we'll be in a better position to tell you what the cost is for getting electricity this way. Now, the second uh, peacetime use is the use of new elements, new elements made in an atomic pile. I want you to think of this nuclear reactor, as it's now called, sort of like a bee's nest, just buzzing with bees. And uh, only in this case, it's buzzing with neutrons. And anything you put in there quickly picks up the neutrons and makes them into other elements. For example, if you have a, a cobalt and you put it in there, a neutron hits the cobalt, it changes into radioactive cobalt. Up in Canada, for example, for $10,000, they made cobalt that was uh, equal in radioactivity to $25 million worth of radium. Uh, they shipped to the University of Michigan, for example, a shipment of radioactive cobalt uh, that was uh, uh, more radioactive than all the radium in the world. It's just unbelievable, uh, the new world that stretches before us. And I can show you how a doctor would use this material. For example, if you take a lump of sulfur and put it into the pile, the neutrons in the pile hit the sulfur and change into radioactive phosphorus. Uh, the uh, phosphorus is radioactive, and, and I'm going to show you uh, what it does. Uh, I'm going to let you hear the Geiger counter click with this. Can you bring the boom down here? <laughs> this is a different kind of a boom that we have in our chem lab, for instance. But I'm going to let you hear uh, what happens. Let's see if it's working. Yes. We'll put this up against here. And when I bring a radioactive material down against this, you can hear the actual click from the radioactive material which is forming. In other words, uh, um, a doctor who is ready to... Uh, um, do an operation for a brain tumor, for example, uh, will um, give a patient just four hours before the operation an injection of radioactive phosphate shipped in from uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, it crosses through the body of the person, gets up to where the tumor is, the faster growing tissue gathers there. And then just before the operation, he monitors with a special kind of a Geiger counter here and here. Click, 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 here and here. He knows exactly where the tumor is and how big it is before he ever cuts a hole in your head. Uh, this is the kind of peacetime work that can be done. And in a single sentence, I can emphasize to you how fantastic this peacetime story is when I tell you and the new world has opened up. Remember, since Madame Curie discovered radium, about four pounds available for industrial and radioactive research. And they have now shipped out from Oak Ridge since 1945, not just radium, but iron and cobalt and I iodine and strontium and all kinds of radioactive materials for industrial and medical research, the equivalent not of four pounds, but of two million pounds. It's just a brand new world. It's a fantastic new world that is before us. This is peacetime research. But unfortunately, until we solve the peacetime research, and the military problem has to be solved before we can make use of the peacetime research. There were 298 positions in Hiroshima when the atom bomb struck, and milliseconds later, there were only 30 to care for the dying. Oppenheimer has testified that 40 million United States citizens could be wiped out overnight by the use of these bombs. 
What are you going to do in a world in which there's such fantastic energy, in which uh, within another 25 years, the world as we know it may be set back for a couple of hundred years? It seems to me there is only one answer, complete and total demilitarization of every nation of the world with a standing international army to maintain peace. We must have at least four things. We must have an international uh, code of living. We must have an international legislature to change this code as economic conditions change. We ha must have an international judiciary to decide whether a nation transgressed. And we must have an international army to maintain this peace using this weapon as weapon for peace, to maintain peace. And what I say to you is that every time we spend a dollar making atom bombs, and heaven knows we have to keep on doing it, every time we give the natural scientists the dollar to make atom bombs, we'll have to give the political and social service people um, a dollar uh, to work out a plan in which we can have peace. Dollar for dollar, we must give a dollar every time for both the natural and the political social people. How are they going to solve? This is a fantastic problem. They're going to have to take off their coats and get into the laboratory of human experience, just like the natural scientist goes into the laboratory to work with hydrogen. They're going to have to get people to understand better the peoples of other nations. This is the step in the right direction. And peace treaties uh, will be mere transitory scraps of paper unless the people in our country understand the peoples in Asia and Africa and uh, South America and Canada. You know, there are 34,000 young people from other nations studying in this country today. This is what I mean as a step in the right direction to get us to understand people better. When we do understand them, when people who have come to us from other lands go back to their other lands and tell us what the United States is like, not just what we see in the Hollywood movies or in the kind of thing that we don't really think represents our democracy, but a sympathetic understanding of those people and getting those people in turn to understand us. When that is achieved, when we have spent dollars for such understanding, this is a step in the right direction. And so I hope that the urgency brought on by the presence of these atom bombs, the fantastic power of these new weapons, will get us busy understanding people all over the world. And will give us not only peace and goodwill amongst men, but under an international law and order, we may look forward at last to peace among men of goodwill. This has been Princeton 55, an exploration into education through television. Featured today was Professor Hubert N. Allier. Princeton 55, a series of programs intended to bring into your living room the exciting ideas and important men of one of the nation's leading universities. Princeton 55 is intended for the listener with an inquisitive mind. Next week, at the same time, Princeton 55 will present Professors Aladar and Victor Ogier. Their subject, Men, Environment, and Architecture. Vic Roby speaking. This has been a WRCA-TV presentation from New York.